Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Emotions and Potions. A love slash hate letter to you. And I'm your host, Ashton. And I'm Alex. Alex, what book are we going to be discussing on this week's up? We are going to be discussing Ruthless Creatures by J.T. Geisinger. And this was actually a recommendation from one of our coworkers and friends, yes. Kayla. So shout out to Kayla. This is your fault. And thank you. <laughs> All right, should we get into the content and trigger warnings for this book? I think we should. Ruthless Creatures does contain graphic sexual content, graphic violence, organized crime and mafia, suicidal thoughts, abandonment, murder, grief, rape, child death, stalking, and kidnapping. Viewer discretion is advised. I mean, what do you expect with a mafia romance, right? (laughs) These are all so normal. (laughs) But yes, you do see all of that in this book. So you're warned. And without further ado, should we just jump into the synopsis yeah. of Ruthless Creatures? An explosive new novel of love, lies, and obsession from best selling author J.T. Geisinger. Five years ago, my fiance disappeared. He left me with a wedding dress I'd never wear, left me with the kind of scars that can't be healed. The man I built my future on vanished like a ghost. All that remained were my broken heart and unanswered questions until a mysterious stranger arrives in town. Tall, dark, and dangerous, Cage is as full of secrets as he is sex appeal. Though I know he's hiding something, I'm drawn to him like a moth to flame. The intensity of our connection is addictive, unlike anything I've ever felt before. Heat crackles between us with every look, desire flares into passion, and I fall hard, unable to resist. But when I discover how he's tied to the darkness in my past, I learn what happens when you fly recklessly into fire. You get burned. That was the most poetic plot synopsis we've had to date. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, there was a lot of like the imagery of it, and I liked that. Like that was very romantic. It was. And... It really doesn't give away a whole lot of plot. It does you not under- prepare you for the twists and turns no. that are about to happen. No. Like, you understand the general gist of it, but every it's still, like, mysterious. It's mm-hmm. still exactly what you said. It does not prepare you for the twists and turns. And there's a lot of them. And there are. So, I think that's a 10 out of 10 as far as the synopsis goes. I enjoyed it. Me too. So before we go into our big plot breakdown, I think it's time for our potion segment. So Alex, what concoction have you come up with for Ruthless Creatures? Well, you named this one. This is a Ruthless Sangria. Yummy. The inspiration behind it is our main character, Nat, and her best friend, Sloane. They have multiple girls' nights throughout this book, and they're always drinking white wine. I didn't want to just deliver white wine. Too basic. And it's not, it's just, it's too basic. You yeah. need, you need it, something. It's just too easy. It's too it, easy. it was too easy. Like, you know, so Sloan is also like a health nut and is always trying to get Nat to be more healthy and like eat vegetables like kale and do yoga. So this is a non-alcoholic white sangria with one of those like prebiotic and probiotic sparkling drinks so very like fresh summer fruity tropical and then I threw in some frozen mangoes so we get a a dose of actual fruit yes I like that and I like the inspiration you always do a good job at making correlations between like the book and your drinks so hats off to you girl thank you all right so it's basically like, you know, a um, healthy and bougie white wine spritzer minus alcohol. And obviously, if you wanted to make this alcoholic super easy to do, just don't get non-alcoholic sangria. White yeah. sangria. All right. And I like the cups you chose. This is cute. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. And you I know really, what? I like this. I think that the, the mango that you added to it really like ups the flavor. Yeah. Like, I like that. Agreed. Because it's like um, the sangria has like supposed to be like passion fruit. Mm-hmm. It's like a main note of it in addition to obviously like, you know, grapes. <laughs> and what did, what did the um, fizzy drink 
probiotic drink. Do you know what flavor that was? Can you remember? Um, strawberry and passion fruit. Oh, okay. Yeah, those, those flavors all work really well together. 10 out of 10, Alex. Yay. This is like so refreshing too. And healthy. And healthy. Mm, it's just like juice. I, I mean, love juice. <laughs> what is non-alcoholic wine but juice? Juice, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Make sure if you want this recipe, it'll be on our Instagram, Emotions and Potions Pod, and also on our TikTok. So should we jump into this book? Yes. It's been five years since Nat was supposed to get married. Her fiancé disappearing without a trace and is now officially declared dead. Usually Nat, who isn't coping with the loss well, would spend the anniversary of this moment getting blackout drunk alone. However, Sloan, Nat's best friend, isn't letting Nat, who was also just dumped, wallow in self-pity. So instead, it's girls' night out to their local bar to get trashed together on white wine. At the bar is Cage, a mysterious, hot, and dangerous new-to-town man. He's been making eyes at Nat all night long, and apparently bought the house next door to hers. One that wasn't even on the market yet. And he paid all cash. Sketchy? I think so. Sloan, who is totally DTF, this new stranger, gets rejected, which is not a normal thing for her. And so then she encourages Nat to make her own move on him since he won't stop staring. At the end of the girls' night, Nat has a choice to make. She can either be babysat by her bestie or go home with Cage. Not wanting Sloane around the following day to bear witness to her depression, she asks Cage to take her home, to which she also gets rejected. Cage has apparently been sent to town for something that may or may not have to deal with Nat, and when he met her, he was caught off guard by her beauty. He is also conflicted because he doesn't mix business with pleasure, or like to break beautiful things. The following morning, Nat is alone, and today would be her fifth wedding anniversary, and she's still in a depressive mood. However, Sloan is not going to let her wallow and decides it's time for Nat to get rid of her wedding dress. That's been haunting her. Natalie tries it on one more time, and someone knocks on the door. It's not Sloan, but Cage, dropping off a misdelivered package. He tells her that she's beautiful, but the dress isn't her and storms out of her house. Sloane and Nat decide Cage must be a recent widower since he's turned both of them down. And this would explain his, like, hot and cold behavior. Not letting her tradition of getting trash for these two days go, Nat decides to switch it up a bit. She goes to the local casino for a fancy night out and people watching. After getting sat for dinner, the maitre d' approaches Natalie and informs her a man would like her to join him. The man in question is Cage, and he's also promised to be on his best behavior. Dinner with Cage is interesting, to say the least. Nat opens up about her situation with the missing fiancé, and, like, the two decide to have a a fresh start. The get-to-know-you small talk reveals that Cage is a debt collector and not a good man. But Nat doesn't need to be afraid of him, because he won't be in town long. Also, Cage definitely wants to fuck, and is very explicit in saying so. Natalie is shocked, but loves this brutal honesty. And after the dinner, Cage takes her home. Of course, the following day, Nat must debrief Sloane about the dirty talk encounter with Cage. Sloane is encouraging Nat to agree to a no-strings-attached get-back-in-the-sex saddle with the hot man. Because Nat hasn't had sex with anyone since her fiancé went missing. Yeah. Five years ago. (laughs) Yeah, she's, like, gone on dates. And And she's dated people. But, but she doesn't arms, let it get to the yeah, keeping intimacy. A, keeping it at arm's length. And when things start to kind of move in that direction, she normally ends it. So Nat is considering it because she's like, this is the first time, like, you know, someone's tickled my pickle in a while. And whose pickle would Cage not tickle? But then the conversation starts to turn more serious about Natalie needing to move on from David. Like, Sloan is like, all right, it's time to cut this emotional cord and Nat decides she needs to stop relying on Sloan to be her like emotional support iguana is what Sloan gets dubbed as their friendship is very funny yeah Sloan's great after this phone conversation Nat has an unexpected visitor from the son of the landlord of her fiance David's old apartment 
he found an envelope addressed to Nat from David and bringing it to her five years later. The envelope contains a key and nothing else. When Nat's recent ex and sheriff stops by trying to get Nat back, he helps her with the mysterious key situation and tells her it's a key to a security deposit box. Even though he was very helpful with the key, he doesn't take Nat's rejection of him well, but thankfully, Cage overhears and gets him to leave. Cage takes a phone call with an inmate from a federal prison and informs him the job is done. And it has something to do with Nat probably killing her. And Cage has just lied to this man because she is definitely alive and well. Apparently, if he ever finds out, Cage and Nat are both as good as dead. Natalie decides to go to the bank and check out what's inside this mystery security deposit box and is confused how David opened one in both of their names without her. Inside the box is a love letter, which sounds like it could be like wedding vows, a love letter, or a goodbye letter. It's like kind of vaguely written. After returning home from the bank and filling Sloan in on the latest developments, Natalie decides it's finally time for her to move on from David. A few months pass by, and Cage has also been gone as well. It's Christmas time, and Nat is baking cookies. When she gets a knock on her door, and it's Cage, back in town, wanting Natalie, as he couldn't stop thinking about her while he was gone. And she's been thinking about him, too. He wants her to give him a chance to be his, and he will go at her pace. After dropping this truth bomb, he heads back to his house next door. Obviously, Sloane is team bang and bag cage, while Nat is still unsure. Sloan does convince Nat to join her and some guys for dinner and happy hour as like a group date, so maybe that's less intimidating. Natalie agrees and asks Cage out, to which he accepts. When Cage picks her up, they share like a very steamy and passionate kiss. Cage plans to make Natalie fall in love with him and warns her if they have sex, she is his and then there's no getting rid of him. At the group date, the men Sloan is entertaining um, somewhat recognize Kane and are shifty towards him. Turns out they're a part of the Russian mob, and Cage is actually the right hand to the head of the whole organization. Natalie is not taking this new development well, and runs towards the bathroom. Cage follows her inside and locks the door and confronts her about the fact that she still wants him even though he's a criminal. He begins to prove it to her by kissing her and teasing her, getting her aroused, Right after he makes her orgasm by fingering her, gunshots ring out. Just way to ruin the moment. <laughs> the restaurant is under attack by two armed Irish mobsters. Cage leaves Natalie in the locked restroom and leaves to check on Sloane. She's being protected by her date, Stavros. And she's not cowering in fear of the situation, but like taking stock of what's going on and like even giving Cage some info via hand signals. Cage kills the Irish attackers and has Stavros take Sloane to safety, and he goes back to get Nat out and leaves the restaurant before the cops show up. On the ride home, Cage and Nat have it out of like what a relationship in life would be like between the two of them. This conversation gets very intense and heated, and it continues at Natalie's house. She decides that she needs to like stop always trying to take the safe option because it doesn't protect you from life's pains and take what she wants regardless of the risk. What she wants is Cage, and she tells him to take her to her bedroom. The sex is hard, rough, and primal. After a post-sex nap, Cage makes breakfast for dinner in bed for Nat and feeds her. Don't, I didn't really care for that. Don't feed me. <laughs> She's so tired. She's all worn out. She needs and, to be hand fed. No, thank you. Which leads to more fucking. Since they've had sex, Nat is Cage's and Cage is Nat's. They belong to each other. They fall asleep after round two when Nat wakes up. Cage is gone. And the cops are pounding on her door. Two police officers are wanting to question Natalie about the shooting at the restaurant. One of the officers is the same one that was assigned to David's disappearance case and considered Nat a suspect in that. So, you know, they don't have a good rapport. Natalie, per Cage's command, refuses to answer their questions and requests they leave her property. Chris, Nat's sheriff ex-boyfriend, who is, is also there and comes up to her stating they found her purse at the restaurant 
and shows Nat a sketch from an eyewitness, which is Cage. Natalie is not budging on giving any information and takes her purse and tells him to leave. Chris, however, isn't dropping Nat's continued rejection. Natalie catches up with Sloane, who has been whisked away to Italy by Stavros and is living like mob lady life up and very happy that Natalie has boinked Cage, even if no anal was involved. Sloane really wants Nat to have anal. Cage then calls Nat and informs her to destroy her phone and there is a new untraceable one waiting for her the password being her mother's birthday. And oh yeah, he's done his stalking homework and knows basically everything about Natalie, including she's a Pisces, like me. Also, She does give Pisces energy. (laughs) Also, Cage will be taking care of her financially now as well. So she is welcome to quit her job, but it's not a requirement. This financial support comes with a seven-figure allowance. Um, Sign me up. (laughs) Where? Who? (laughs) Cage gets called away on business and won't be back in town for a bit, but will try to make it back by Christmas. Nat's head is swimming, but she is still swooning over our mobster. A few weeks go by, and Cage is still out of town on mob business. He and Nat talk on the phone daily, but they are short calls. Chris is keeping his promise and keeping an eye on Nat's house and is becoming stalker and is low-key harassing her. It boils over on Christmas Eve night. Natalie is letting her dog out for his nighttime pee when a tipsy Chris approaches Nat. He wishes her a Merry Christmas and tries to warn her away from Cage and lets it spill he knows exactly who Cage is, the Grim Reaper of the Russian mob. Nat has had enough of his harassing antics and pulls a shotgun on him and demands he leave her alone and get off of her property. Also, the shotgun is not loaded. (laughs) It's just the gun. When Nat goes back to her room, she is shaken again by someone in her room. Thankfully, the intruder is a welcome one. It's Cage, but he has a gunshot wound in his shoulder. Nat wants to tend to his injuries. Cage has something else in mind. The naked kind. (laughs) The sex wins out, as does shower sex. Cage also opens up to Nat about his past. He grew up in Hell's Kitchen, New York. His parents owned a butcher shop and were killed by the Irish mob when he was 15. After their deaths, he took over working the shop and caring for his two sisters. He got revenge and killed the men who murdered his parents, and the Irish retaliated, raping and murdering his younger sisters. Cage got involved with the Russian mob after his parents' death when they helped him with his cleaning up for a price. This honesty brings them closer as Nat understands him better and accepts him for who he is, flaws and all, and Cage is obsessed with Nat's kind-heartedness. He is also very touched that Nat bought him clothes with her own money. She hasn't touched her trust fund money yet either. Cage is internally struggling with the reason he came to Lake Tahoe, which we still don't know all the details about. One thing we learn is that Cage knows what truly happened to David, the ex-fiance. It wasn't him taking a tumble hiking, which everyone assumes is what happened. He is scared about Nat learning the truth and what it would mean for her safety, life, and the status of their relationship. He is convinced he needs to continue with the double life and keep this info away from Nat at all costs. Nat finally patches Cage's wounds up and she informs him about the altercation with Chris and how he has given the FBI info about him. Cage isn't worried about the feds and will be taking care of the Chris problem. He is worried about Nat's home safety. Thankfully, he will be around until New Year's though. It's Christmas morning, and Cage has a present that isn't his dick for Nat. It's a promise ring. How romantic. Natalie learns it will never be an engagement ring because Cage is not allowed to get married without the Bratva's boss permission, and it won't be granted to Nat, as she should be dead. (laughs) Obviously, Nat does not know that part. That part. But we do as readers. Nat is pissed about this nugget of info, but there's nothing she will do about it because she is in love with Cage. Their argument leads to Nat wanting to punish him, so he drops his sweatpants and assumes the position. Natalie gets to spank Cage, and in return, he gets his wish of spanking her, which leads to them having sex. Cage is opening a whole new sexual world for Nat, who has been celibate for five years. (laughs) Natalie and Cage's emotional bond has grown deeper, and she feels even more connected to him. 
Sadly, it's the new year and Cage must leave her again. Nat gets a call from Sloane and she is also at Nat's front door. The besties catch up on everything that has happened while they have been apart. Nat also gets more intel on the mafia news and learns there's a war between all New York families, which explains Cage's Christmas Eve bullet wound. During the night, Nat's usually very lazy dog starts to get agitated and protective, which sets the girls off. They race around Nat's place, locking all windows and doors, but don't find anything. Sloane then notices Nat's promise ring and freaks out, thinking her friend is engaged. Nat informs her that Cage can't marry her because of the mafia boss and how he can't have children. In New York, Cage is taking care of warring mafia business by sabotaging shipment routes for other families' various supplies. While working, he gets a text from Nat. He calls her back after the meeting with his men is done, and Nat tells him she loves him. After dropping the I love you bomb, Nat doesn't hear from Cage for a few days, and this sends her into a bit of a spiral. She can't help but think something happened to him like it did with David. Sloan tries to talk some sense into Nat that she needs to tell Cage this. Nat is about to call Cage, but it's not necessary because he is in her house. So they get to have the talk in person after some sex, of course. Duh. Cage promises he will check in with her daily and apologizes for not recognizing how lack of communication would be triggering for her. Nat can tell he is holding something back and she is concerned it may be another woman. Cage quickly confirms that isn't a concern and he would kill his boss and burn the world down before he turned his back on her. But he doesn't tell her about the thing he has been hiding. That night, Cage and Nat have more sex, including Nat's first time doing anal. Unfortunately, Cage isn't sticking around for long. He is off again and will be gone for a month, but promises to make it back for Natalie's birthday. Skip forward to Nat's birthday. She has been going a little bit stir-crazy without Cage. She gets a text from him that she'll see him soon. After many hours, he still hasn't shown up yet. Then Nat's phone starts to ring. This call is a collect call from prison, and it's Maxim McDonovich, the head of the Russian mafia on the line for Nat. Dun, dun, dun. He lets Nat know that Cage has betrayed him by not killing her, and as punishment, he has sent someone else to do the job, and he is going to go after her parents. When that phone call ends, she is faced with her new assassin, Victor. He starts to interrogate her about where the money is and where he is hiding. She thinks Victor is talking about Cage, so she informs him about the trust and that he lives in Manhattan. She gets confused when Victor accuses her of being a slut and sleeping with two men. Nat's dog once again goes into protection mode and attacks Victor. This distraction allows a returning Cage to grab Nat's shunk on that is now loaded, and he blows Victor's head off. So things have escalated, and it is time for some truth bombs. Natalie's fiancé, David, stole $150 million from Maxim. His real name is Damon, and he is not dead. He was the accountant for the mob who wound up making a deal with the feds, testifying against Max, which helped land him in his life prison sentence. In exchange, he got put into witness protection. That's how he wound up in Lake Tahoe and was able to meet Nat. Oh, and he also left behind a wife and children. This is a lot of info for Nat to take in, and she feels betrayed by David and Cage. She throws Cage out of her house. He honors her wish to leave, but states he will be back in an hour. Within that hour, Nat comes to the realization about the note David left in the security deposit box and enters detective mode. She tears apart her house, looking into her art for the next clue, which is finding a note with one word, Panama. It's off to the airport. She finally taps into her trust money and she books a flight to Panama where they were supposed to honeymoon. When she arrives at the hotel, she asks the front desk woman if there is a message for her. There is, but it's under a different name from a movie with a plot that kind of mirrors their current situation. This note there is an address and so Nat makes her way there. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego, <laughs> aka David? <laughs> Meanwhile, Cage, when he returns to Nat House to find her gone and her house torn apart, starts tracking her with the phone he gave her. He has her GPS location. Sly dog. 
While he is chasing her, he texts and calls Nat, but she ignores him while she's on her mission to find and confront David. Upon getting to David's island palace, Nat passes out. When she wakes up, she immediately goes into confrontation mode. She goes off on him about how he deceived her, led her to believe he was missing slash dead for so long, abandoned his whole ass family. Why did he have to be such a cheap steak when he was loaded, being in the mafia of all things? David tries to brush his wrongdoings off and slightly turns things back on Nat, especially since it took her so long to find him. He is more concerned about the Russians knowing he is alive and what info they have on him currently. He also tries to make it seem like the kids aren't his and that him and his mafia wife were an arranged marriage that did not have any love. After the confrontation and Nat being like, well, the joke is still on me because the man who was originally supposed to kill me didn't, just so he could fuck me. There's a voice that says, I was never playing you. I loved you from day one. Cage has followed Nat around the world and has a gun pointed at David. Though he could give two shits about that fucker, he is just there to get his girl. Nat is still mad at Cage, and rightfully so, but she's glad that he came to her, and she's definitely over David. Even more so when their reunion gets interrupted by a woman walking in exclaiming, Nikki, honey, I'm home. David waited a year for Nat, then married someone else. Cage takes Nat with him to New York so she cannot return to Lake Tahoe. Cage also made a deal with the Italians to have Max killed in prison, which makes Cage the new head of the Russian mafia. Nat is still giving Cage a bit of a cold shoulder in New York. He shows her a room he had set up for her to be an art studio. She is confused as to why he did this since she was never going to be able to join him in New York. And it was for him to go in and imagine her there when he missed her. That's so sweet. After Nat gets settled into Cage's home, she checks in with Sloane and fills her in on everything that she has missed. In typical Sloan fashion, she isn't phased and is still Team Cage and Nat. Cage is trying to give Nat her space to cope, so he doesn't plan on sleeping in bed with her, but she quickly decides that she needs him and goes to get him, and he was waiting right outside the door for her the, the whole time. They fall into bed and have makeup sex. The next week, men stopped by to pay their respects to Cage, the new leader. Stavos asks permission to kidnap Sloan because he still wants her, but Cage said no. Nat was more worried about Stavros' safety in this scenario than Sloan's because Sloan cut it off and there's no going back when Sloan cut something off. Turns out Sloan is the reason for the current war. Shocker. The night at the dinner, some Irish mobsters slapped her ass when they were passing, then came up to the table being disrespectful when Cage and Nat were having their moment. And that is what set off the shootout. Since things are more settled and established with the relationship, Nat is starting to rethink Cage not being able to marry her and the no whole kids thing. He has her go into his office and look in a drawer and she finds a brochure about vasectomy reversals and then he has her go in his jacket pocket and she finds an engagement ring. And then of course we do get an epilogue. So Sloane is coming to New York to bring Nat's dog Mojo and visit her newly engaged bestie. When she arrives at the building, her car gets surrounded and gunfire starts. She gets pulled out of the car, then confronted by an Irishman, Declan, who tells her he's taking her to Boston to meet with his boss. So set up for, for book, book two. two. And that, ladies and gents, was Ruthless Creatures. Oh. So good. All right, Alex. Now that we've kind of broken down the plot, you're all caught up. If you've read it, if you needed a refresher, should we go into our smut talk and talk about our favorite scenes? Yes. Because there were so many. And like the sex scenes were wild. So good. So good. So what was your favorite smutty, sexy time scene in that first half of the book? Round two of the first time they have sex. So after he feeds her? Yeah. Where you're like, don't feed me. Yeah. Okay. So for round two, he looks in her bedside table. And when he opens it, he sees like a cacophony of sex toys. Because she was definitely getting herself off. She just wasn't letting anyone else do it. She basically had like 
all the toys, all the vibrators, any and anything you could think of. Nat is had in it. that bedside table. <laughs> and he was like, the fuck? Because this is very out of character for Nat. Like, I would not have expected that. No, because she comes across as being, like, very vanilla and, like, reserved. And she is until she meets Cage. And at first, Cage is like, um, well, you can get rid of all of these because you have me now. Which, mm, no. Toys do things that the male anatomy cannot do. <laughs> but that, you know mindset doesn't last very long because then he like sees this big like pink dildo like kind of almost like the novelty joke ones that you would buy for someone because it's like huge and then he also gets out like one of those um like clit sucker vibrator things and he starts going to town with her with those toys and I enjoyed this because of the use of toys in Sex. Yeah, we really haven't read a whole lot that incorporate sex toys. Yeah, there At was, least I haven't. There was a little bit mentioned of that with um, Josh and Jules. Oh, yeah. But nothing like this. I don't think I've ever read anything. As in depth and like. Intense yeah. with the sex toys. Yeah. And yeah, that was my favorite. Okay, that was a good one. But I think mine has you beat. Well, Yes. Because okay. we only got like one <laughs> I know. round in part one of the book. This was a slow burner. So you're right. The most sex happens in that second half of the book. My favorite sex scene is the spankings. Oh my God, yes. So not only that, I'm just going to go kind of step by step with what happens. I, I reread this two chapters. It's two chapters, this one sex scene today to refresh my memory. So it starts with Nat spanking him because she's kind of like, I've never done anything like that. I don't feel comfortable. And he's kind of like, well, what if I went first? Like he was kind of like. She's like, would you let me do it to you? And he was like, yeah. So she has like a brush and she turns it to the backside. Yeah. It's like one of those wooden paddle brushes. Yeah. And he pulls his pants down and she spanks away and has him count. They come to the agreement that she'll give him 10 spanks and he counts after each one. And by like spank five. She's into this. She's really into this. And so is Cage. Cage is hard, pre-cum, you know, the whole nine yards. So then she kind of wraps her hand around him in the front. She doesn't jack him off. Oh yeah, she just She just grips because he's then like, jack me off and spank me. And she's like, oh, but you're not in charge. I am. You're not in charge. So after the 10th spank, he turns around and he's like, my turn, takes her back to the bedroom, throws her over his lap. He sits on the end of the bed, pulls her pants down, and then they have this conversation about the green, the light system or the color system. Yeah. So green, go. Yellow, I'm kind of iffy. Red, stop. And he's like, you're always in control. No matter if it seems like I am, you're calling the shots. So he starts really easy with a with a level one, level two, checks in. Then he goes up to a level three, checks in. And like throughout this whole thing, they're like having this open dialogue. And obviously she's very much into it and he can catch on pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So by the end of it, she is like withering on his lap. And he is like, well, you like this. Like He's like, I could make you come just by spanking you. And she's like, yeah, you probably could. So then after the spanks have reached the 10. Yep. He then um, has her get on the floor and she sucks his dick as he continues to still slap her. But after that, before he can come, he then gets her on the bed, puts her in the middle. He goes into her like dresser and pulls out some stockings and he ties her up. So he ties her hands above her head and then he says that she will not come until he tells her to and until he is inside of her. And she's like, but why? And he's like, because it's going to be so much better. Like the orgasm denial. Orgasm withdrawal. Yeah. Yep. So he ties her up and then he starts slapping her puss, which she likes. He goes down on her as she's tied up. Then he goes back to the bureau and gets a blindfold blindfolds that bitch up. Sensory deprivation. So she is tied and blinded. Then he goes over to her little bureau 
her little sex toy bureau and pulls out a vibrator and puts the vibrator in her and makes her suck his dick again as he is fucking her with this vibrator. There's a lot to these sex scenes, clearly. So much. And then, finally, after all of that, he then fucks her and she like has an explosive orgasm when she kind of comes down from it she's like crying like she's bawling her eyes out and the aftercare is there he kisses the tears from her eyes unblindfolds her unties her cleans her up and then they like snuggle and pass out but yeah it was so much but it was so good yeah these were very intense sex scenes but like oh my goodness they were so hot yeah like cage Chef's kiss. Yes. Chef's fucking kiss. Like, dirty talk. Check. Like, actually caring and um, providing multiple orgasms. Check. Being dominant. Check. But also, also submissive. Also submissive. So he can be dominant. Check. And then aftercare. Yeah. Like, just... It's all check, 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 check. But, like, this book just had so many sex scenes. So if you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading it just for those because they will blow your mind. Yeah, especially with the use of toys because you really don't get that a whole, whole lot. And then there's also like an anal scene, Mm -hmm. which is also very like it's aggressive and like passionate, but it's also like prep work is done. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention in this last scene, he also does shove a finger up there. That's like the first kind of like testing the waters yeah and that's like what peaks her to agree to yeah and then it like slowly gets her to be like hmm maybe it won't be that bad but yeah that was my favorite sex scene in part two which leads directly to our love and hate segment yay all right i think i'm just gonna say it fucking sloan yeah love that bitch love sloan love the friendship between nat and sloan it's very reminiscent of, like, our friendship, our friendship with Kayla, the banter that, like, we have, and even with, like, some of our other friends. Just, yes. Just, like, it's very much how we communicate. And I think that Nat, people. the type of character that Nat is, she needs a friend like Sloane who's going to push her out of her comfort zone, kind of be brass, kind of, like, tell her exactly how it is in a loving and supporting way, but, like, not being around the bush. Yep. Because she's supportive, but she's also, like, girl you got to get your shit together. Like, it's been five years. This man is obsessed with you. And he's hot. And he's freaking gorgeous. What are you What are you waiting on? Like, test the waters with that. Get, have a fling. Get your groove back. And another thing that I liked about Sloan, and more so with the writing in general, is that I've noticed a lot of times when, in romance books, when you have a dynamic between, like, two female best friends— Normally in the beginning, they're real close. But then as the love story progresses, that that character fades away. This book, like Sloane, yeah, she was not the main character. But like she constantly was popping up. Yeah. And like they were constantly checking in with each other. Which is exactly what like best friends would do. Yeah. So like I really like hats off to JT because a lot of times you lose that character arc. And that continued in book two as well. Like Sloane and Nat were still checking yes. in with each other, even though Sloane winds up, you know, being like a kidnap hostage right. thing. So well done. I loved Cage's declarations that he made. Like if a man doesn't feel or say these things to me in real life, I don't want it. And then kind of going off of that, his dirty talk... Like, not like he has those like big declarations that like aren't corny and don't make you cringe. They make you like be gushing with want. Yes. But then he also is a filthy talker, and you're just like, you can do both. Oh my God. It's like he (laughs) sees into like her soul and like being as a person and lets her know that. Like, there's this one line where this one part where he's like, I don't care like if you gain weight, if you. If your beauty fades, like, you are still going to be the same person, and I love your heart. And, like, you will be mine forever. Forever. There will be no... Others. There will be no mistresses. No one will ever be able to, like, make my head turn. 
like he just constantly reassured her and just like, again, if a man will not bring me that energy, I don't want it. And that's exactly what Nat needed too with her kind of issues with the whole David thing with him like going missing. She needs someone to constantly reassure her that they're not going anywhere, which is totally understandable. Trauma. (laughs) I actually was pretty content with the pacing of this book, even though once they decided to get together at that that peak, things happened very, very fast, but I wasn't mad at it. It wasn't something where I was like, okay, insta-love, this just like whatever. I liked that it was more of a buildup and that peak and then they kind of just like dove in. I slightly disagree. <laughs> I knew you would. I <laughs> slightly disagree. Um, one of my hates more so an ick is the insta-love. This for me was very insta lovey, But like it kind of makes sense for the type of people they are because like both of them are like when I fall, I fall hard and I can't fall fast. So, like, they were able to rationalize the insta-love, but it's just just not my favorite trope. Yeah, and I think that I didn't have so much of an issue with it just because it was a slow burn that this didn't happen in Chapter 3. You know, like, this happened at 50% almost. That's where it became more of an ick versus, like, a true hate. Right. But it's still, like, you didn't love it. But but I could overlook it. it cross into, like, a hate. Yeah, yeah. I loved all the, you know, twists and turns that the actual plot took us on. The twists and turns were fantastic. It was just like layer after layer. And it was just, it was so good. So well done. It all made sense. It all worked. I also thought that the reveal of all of these things was done really well. Mm -hmm. It made sense as to how A went to B that went to C kind of and the unraveling of you know, the fact that Cage knew David or Damon. Or Nikki, it, whatever he right, Whatever to go his by. name is, that, you know, he was involved with the Russian mob, that Cage was sent to kill Nat to get the money back, that he's been alive and well this whole time. And something that we didn't mention in the plot summary is that we do also learn that David, David tells Nat that the his FBI agent or his person in protective services or whatever told him that the Russian mob was getting close to him and that's why he fled. But when Cage enters, he's heard this whole conversation and he goes, also, we didn't find out that you were still alive until a year ago. He dipped five years ago. So like David's just a shitty dude. Yeah. But like all of those things that you find out, it's just like... <gasps> So good. It was so good. So wild. It was so good. And the writing of it was just so good. And how like that epilogue leads right into the book too. Just- oh, yeah. I do like that Cage ultimately becomes the boss of the mafia by eliminating the threat to him, which is Max and Nat. Um, he's a threat to both him and Natalie, really. And how he goes about it was really clever. Like I like that it's like it's not being traced back to him because if it was, people would have an issue with it. Yep. That he got like another person in prison who's not part of their mafia was a part of the Italian mafia to make it look like an accident to make it look like wrong time wrong place yep type of thing and that cage is now the head honcho like i liked that progression as well because maxim had to go yeah i mean if he didn't like there was no way nat and cage could have their happily ever after no especially because he sent victor which is also another thing that i really liked even though like Obviously, I wouldn't want Natalie to go through something like that as, like, a female. But I thought that that kind of twist, mm-hmm. that kind of plot point was also really good. And it also kind of proves how, like, he's always going to protect her and, like, come after like come after her to, like, be there for her sort of thing. And ultimately, Victor was really the one that made Natalie, like, the light bulb go off. Yeah. And she was like, oh, shit. I, I think I know what now that... Things have kind of come out. She was able to piece things together. So thanks, Victor. Yeah. See you in hell, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) My last love is just the sex scenes. Oh, yeah. Just everything that they incorporated, everything that they, it was just, each one was so different, really intense, 
like longer. Very long. Like these lasted, I think like almost each sex scene lasted like two chapters because you got one from Nat's point of view and like one from Cage's point of view. Yeah. It was refreshing because I haven't, like I said, read many books that incorporated all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. All right, Alex, should we just go into our hates? Yes. Mine are very unhinged hates. Oh, gosh. Okay, what are they? And slightly petty. I'll start with the funny petty one first. Okay. Um, I hated the cat bashing that happened in this book. Right. Sloan, right? And Nat. Both hated on cats. And, okay. And um, as a cat owner, didn't like it. Rubbed you the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So my first hate is I wish they killed David when they confronted him. They just kind of left him to kind of well, he was deal with his wife. And, to them at, at that point. No, but like he's a shitty dude. Yeah. Like he just rubbed me the wrong way. Well, Nat did ask Cage not to. Stupid Nat. Sloan would have said. Sloan would have pulled the trigger herself. Oh, I know. But I just like, I don't know. With like how this. like r- She didn't want that on her conscience. Yeah, but like thinking about it from like a realistic point of view. There's no way a cage in real life would allow would him. allow him to live. Yeah, but yeah, it kind of feeds right into my next hate, which is I hated how much wallowing Nat did over the beige tube sock of a fiance that was David Bro, in the beginning of this book. Bro, he sounded so boring. He was a beige tube sock and bland. Yeah, yeah, like no excitement. But like she also was like very young when they met. Yeah, because he, he was like he 10 was years, 10 years older. older than her. And all the descriptions that she kind of like was with th- when she would think about him, I'm like, like why are you, why are you so hung up for, on him for, after five years? Yeah, I mean, even Chris sounded better and yeah. he wasn't that great. No. Which leads me into my last tape. Chris was annoying. Um, he doesn't take no for an answer. Uh, he needs to leave Natalie alone. And I just think that Nat really picks duds. Until Before Cage. Before Cage. But I feel like he picked her. She didn't necessarily pick him. Yeah, that's true. But like the stuff with Chris, I was just like, take a freaking hint. Like no means no. And she was being blatant. Like, and she was, she, but she was being nice about it too. Like she wasn't being a bitch. No. But, but she, she was like, she dude. She was up front. She was not like hinting or like. No, she was like, dude, there's nothing romantic between us. Go find somebody who actually wants to be with you. Go find someone who will fuck you because I will not. <laughs> right. But not deal. <laughs> My last hate and is the most unhinged. Oh, God. Okay. I hate the promise ring exchange. Really? I don't think adults should give promise rings. Oh, yeah. You've told me this before. Engagement rings and being engaged is the fucking promise. But the whole thing was that Cage would never be able to be engaged to her. But he wound up being able to be. Yeah, because of drastic measures that he wasn't thinking of ever taking oh. until he had to because he got found out. He was going to keep Nat as his little secret for the rest of his life if he had to. The only reason he didn't was because Max found out and was going to freaking kill her. And then he was like, you don't do that. So he gave her a promise ring out of no. that. no. Because then there's no fucking promise. The promise I'm never going to be able to fucking marry you. No, it was the promise Suck of my dick. He would never <laughs> marry anyone else. Come on. That is petty. I hate it so much. Because we've had this conversation. I know we have. Of books. I know. Adults should not give promise rings. It's fucking stupid. I think in like real life, I agree. But in this, this setting, this book, I wasn't annoyed with it. I was. I know. I can tell. Hate it. You're fuming. <laughs> <laughs> You're hot and bothered I'm, and not in the good type of way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I told you it was unhinged. It was you unhinged. You should have seen this coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, those were our loves and hates. Some of them more petty than others. And my soapbox rant. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> so let's head into something fun, which is our casting. Yeah. So for Ruthless creatures we cast obviously nat and cage Duh. sloan and david so would you like to start us off with your nat my nat is hallie steinfeld that's a good one. that's a good one i like her 
She would do a good job. Yeah. So I went with this girl named Isabella Villamizar. She is an Australian TikToker. No idea who she is. I didn't either until my Google search took me to her. She's very pretty. She gives me like very much the aesthetic of Nat. Like the dark, yeah. dark hair, blue eyes, you know. That's and that's really I've never watched her TikToks. I don't know anything about her personally, like solely aesthetic. Fair. Yeah. And accurate. So who did you cast as your leading man, Cage? The mafia leader. Terry Walsh from Love Island, UK. That's actually fantastic. When he was on Love Island. Yeah. So a f- few years ago, but still. Because there's not very many recent photos of him, so don't know if, like, the aesthetic is still there. I hope it is. I think he's more of, like, rocking, like, a dad bod, which isn't, I mean, he's older, like, yeah, it's fine. But from his season of Love Island, that. The tattoos, the dark hair, the tan, the muscles, the height. Yeah. The bad boy. Yeah. 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 Ooh, I love me some Terry Walsh from Love Island, season two. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen it, so. <laughs> Watch it. Hulu. (laughs) (laughs) Shameless plugs. (laughs) So my cage is John Hennigan, also known as John Morrison from WWE. I know exactly who that is because I'm the wrestling fan. Yep. Between the two of us. (laughs) So it was funny because Kayla was actually the one who put it in my head to look at like wrestlers mm-hmm. because we were talking about this book. Obviously I told her that I read it cause she recommended it. Yeah. And so she was just like, well, when you guys do your casting, she's like, maybe you should look into like professional, like WWE wrestler or something like that. And so that's why I was like, Hmm, maybe I should branch into it. The like aesthetic is there for me with him. Like the longer hair. I mean, he's ripped. Yeah. The only thing he's, he's little- very agile. Have you actually ever seen him wrestle? No. But the only thing that I would change is just the height. Yeah. He's a little short. Cage is like 6'5". Not many people in real life are 6'5". No. But like my ideal casting, he would be 6'5". But it would be him. All right. You're Sloan. Who did you cast as the bestie? This was also Kayla's casting. Um, She put this idea in my head. I have previously cast this person in something else. And it is Raven Ross from Love is Blind Season 3. She is also, in real life, a Pilates instructor. Oh, okay. And Sloane's a yoga, yoga teacher. Yep. And just, like, her humor seems to be very reminiscent of Sloane. And just, like, her I don't give a fuck attitude. Okay. I like that. I like that. I went more aesthetic again, kind of because I feel like that's what I was doing with a lot of my casting for this one. So I ended up going Kate Upton. For Sloan. Because Sloan was also described as like being very beautiful, you know, could get a lot of guys. And I was, I don't know, I could picture, I was kind of picturing someone who looked like Kate Upton a little bit. But maybe like five years younger. Age her down a little, a little bit. bit yeah. But yeah, Kate. And last but not least, our anti favor I don't even know, the villain of the story. Yeah. This tube sock of the story. <laughs> Who did you cast as your David? Tom Felton. Really? Yeah. Draco Malfoy. Yeah. Okay. I kind of like that, though. So I went Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I love him. I do, too. I love him. I love Tom Felton, too. He's just kind of got that nerdy. He looks like an accountant. So does Tom Felton. Oh, yeah. Well, sweet. If you want to see more of our picks for our casting, head over to... Our Instagram, Emotions and Potions Pod. We got to give this book a soundtrack. Start us off, Alex. All right. Nat and Sloan song. Best friend, Sweetie and Doja Cat. Okay. That's good. I also have a Sloan and Nat's BFF anthem, and that's Wannabe by Spice Girls. I could just picture them drinking their white wine in the living room being drunk and just belting it or like karaoke yes like that would be their go-to song so on the same page so far with Mm -hmm. our theme okay so my next one is sad nat and sad cage song lovely billy eilish and Khaled. that's a good one i like that so i have a nat being sad theme song 
which Nat's sad for like that first part of the book. It was it's Mood Ring by Lord. Yeah. Like I could see her like listening to that on repeat and her like being depressed. I could just see her listening to Lord in, in general. general. Yeah. Like, just same, same. <laughs> My next one is Sloan Song to Nat, trying to get her out of her funk and like hype her up. Pretty Girls Walk. Big Boss Vet. Ooh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a very hype up. Bad bitch. Come on. Yeah. So mine next category is Nat and David's kind of like theme song. And it's Three Cheers for Five Years by Mayday Parade. <laughs> yes. I just thought it yes. was clever because it's a sad song mm-hmm. and it's also like five years like. Perfect. Yeah. So my next one is Broken Hearted Nat song with David and Cage. All I Wanted, Paramore. Ah, oh, love that song. Great pick. My next category, Nat and Cage's heartbreak song, Whenever Cage is Gone. Every Time You Leave by I Prevail and Delaney Jane. So same category, but different song. Hung Up from Madonna. Oh, nice. My next category, Nat and Cage's love song to each other. And I do have two for this one category because I couldn't choose. So I have Finally Slash Slash Beautiful Stranger by Halsey and Pieces of Me by Ashley Simpson. Very nice. (laughs) That's a throwback on that one. I know. And I love it. I was jamming out to it the other day when I like added it to the playlist. You know what? Underappreciated album. My next song is Cage's Declarations song and specifically like the song title of this he kind of says these words verbatim in the book I will follow you into the dark death cab for cutie I saw that one and I was like "Ooh, that's a good song yeah I'm glad you picked it and I like that category too so my last theme I saved is the sexy time theme songs and I have two for this category as well because I couldn't choose and it's Death by Sex by Kim Petras. And also Bad for You by Meek Mill and Nicki Minaj. Because I think he says that too, that like he's bad for her. Yeah. So perfect. Yeah. Do you have one more category? I do. So my last one is a song for the good girl in Mobster Love Story. Okay. So basically, you know, the whole, let's sum this whole thing The gist thing up. of this book. Mm-hmm. What it is from Doji. Ooh. Okay. That's awesome. That's a good one, too. This playlist was banging. Mm-hmm. I mean, we say that after, like, for every playlist. We do. But it's also true. But it's so true. This playlist is so good. So definitely go over and check it out on Spotify. Emotions and Potions Pod. And it's literally labeled Ruthless Creatures. JT Geisinger. And it's going to put you in the, like, music aesthetic of this book. Of this book. And while you are there, check out our other playlist because they're also all banging. They get better and better each time we do this. They do. Let's rate this this book. What did you give the spice of this? 4.5. I did too. I did too. I thought there were a lot of things that definitely made it spicy. Yes. I mean, it was explicit. There was a lot of it. Everything was very varied. Um, we had toys, but nothing was too crazy. Right. So it doesn't get a five. Right. But it's more than a four. Yes. I agree. Well said. And overall. Eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. I gave it a 9.2 out of ten. <laughs> Very specific with the point two there. <laughs> I know. I didn't want to just give it a nine. Because I feel like I give most books like a nine. But I really enjoyed this book. And I think also I've been really enjoying this series mm-hmm. as a whole. So I was just like, you know what? I'm a fan. Like, I liked, yeah. I, I, it was hard to set this book down once I started reading it. How far in this series are you? I'm on the last book. Okay. I'm which on, is book four. Okay. I've read books one and two. I'm on three. Haven't started it yet, though. Okay. Yeah, because book two is Sloan and an Irish mobster. Book three is her sister Riley with another, like, Russian assassin. And then book four is Spider, who is... One of Declan's. Declan's, who is Sloane's boy, his, like, second in command, and his is, like, an arranged marriage with, I think, either an Italian or a 
Mexican cartel, cartel, mob, whatever. And I haven't, I've, I've just started that one. I haven't finished that though. I recommend book two. And I recommend book three too. I mean, I mean, all of them are so, they're really good. All right. Before we do the final sign off question for you then, from what you've read so far, which man would you pick for yourself? Oof. That's hard because all of the leading men are very different while also being very similar because they're all mobsters. So they all have similar characteristics. I kind of want to go with Riley's dude, Mal. Book three. Mm -hmm. I don't know him. Um, I'm picking Declan. I knew you would pick Declan. Which is why I didn't want to pick Declan. I mean, you could have. I know. I like Declan. I like De- I like all of them for different reasons. Mm-hmm. But I think I like Mal because he's, I feel like, the roughest. Interesting. Like, not sexually. Okay. But, like, around the edges. But, like, he treats her so well. And I also don't know if it's just because they're the freshest one that I've, like, read recently. But when I got done with their book, I kind of was like, you know what? I'm a fan of him. Fair. But but Cage is a close second, and so is Declan. They're all fantastic. Declan's my number one. Yeah, I knew you would. I didn't even have to ask to know. <laughs> Predictable, Alex. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Well, at least you know what I want. <laughs> exactly. You're consistent. <laughs> but I think it's pretty obvious from our like loves and hate talk that I'm giving this hands down a love letter oh absolutely agree it's a love 100% would recommend so happy Kayla recommended it Mm -hmm. so she can she can do the pics from now on yeah but all right love letter for ruthless creatures from both Ash and Alex and Kayla and Kayla honorary honorary (laughs) we should have had her on the episode but (laughs) shout out to Kayla thank you for the rec See you at work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure to like, subscribe, rate, leave a review. Share. All the positive things. Tell your friends. You know, all the things. Uh, we're Emotions and Potions Pod on... Hmm. All of the socials. And until next time, I'm Alex. Mm. I'm Ashton. Bye. See ya. Bye.